uh, I mentioned the revival over at Trinity in Centerville. How many of you might be interested in going over there at some time? Let's do this. Tuesday night, let's take the van over if y'all do that. Let's meet over here at church. The meeting starts at 7. And um, I mean, I'm sure it's pretty much a 30 minute. I mean, really not. Probably about a 15 minute drive over, 15, 18 minutes. But let's meet over here at 6, 15 ish, somewhere along there. And try to, I mean, let's try to be here, you know, and leave if we leave as soon as we can after that. I mean, it may be 6 30. But uh, may, you may text us. I don't know. So we know who not. I don't want to leave anybody. But if you get here by, if you go out here, get here at six thirty, we probably will be gone. You know. So try to get here about six fifteen. If you can we'll pile in as many as we can. If we have to, we'll take our car or whatever. But it'd be good to support a uh, brother. Um, no, um, Olson is over there. Did he ever visit here on deputation? There were missionaries to uh, Italy. And served to the military in Italy, and we're over there several years. And um, you know, he came home, and he's got they've got family there. He came home most, most I guess, basically on a furlough, but ended up not going back. And, and when Brother Hyman resigned over there at Trinity, it just Lord opened the door for him to go over there and all. But uh, it'd be a real encouragement for a handful of us to show up over there and support the meeting. And uh, when you do that in return, a lot of those folks might come to our meetings and things, and it just helps when we fellowship together. That's one thing I like being independent Baptist, that we're independent, we don't, we don't, Tuesday night, yes, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday is about 6.15. But being independent, we operate independently. We don't answer to another church or we don't send our funds to a mother church, so to speak, that's not biblical, but we, fellowship with others. We don't have to be so independent that we don't fellowship with others. I love the fellowship amongst my independent Baptist brethren. So let's go ahead and Brother Bryant leads another good song. We'll do that though. Y'all remember a lot of different ones on the prayer list. We pray for them, Ricky and Beverly, uh, a lot, and all, you know, certainly all the different ones. Brother, uh, Brother David uh, in rehab, remember him, Miss Louise, and uh, several others. Just be praying people. All right, 459, <clears throat> 459, fill my cup, Lord. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, Fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasure earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. So, my brother, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to Him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more.
Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Amen. Amen. 102 for our last congregational. When you find your spot, if you can, stand with us as we sing, I stand in the amazed, I stand amazed in the presence. <laughs> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, He prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for His own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Hold on just a second. Let's, let's do something. That verse 4, let's sing again. I want to tell you something. The word marvelous really was never a word that was in my vocabulary. I mean, back 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I never got stuck in the mud in my four-wheel drive and jumped out and turned around and said, boy, that was marvelous. <laughs> I just never used that word. But boy, we're talking about our Lord and Savior, marvelous. He's full of marvel. Yes. He is truly marvelous. Let's sing that. Where'd you go? Put that back up there if it ain't too much trouble. That's marvelous right there. Yeah, that's marvelous. <laughs> yeah. Hey, now, let's do that fourth verse. Let's sing that one more time again. When with the ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me How marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. With the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see. T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brian. Thank you, Miss Donna. Good music tonight. I appreciate it. So. 
Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Now, Brother Bryant, this morning I was teasing you about when you get there, I'll say the outline of that, but now I guess I may, I may repeat some things you said when you were in Luke chapter 10 a few months ago, so I may owe you money, so maybe we'll just call it even, okay? <laughs> wow, I ain't believing that. <laughs> yeah, somebody mark that down in your calendar. <laughs> Brother, thank you for getting that. I was uh, uh, starting to scratch up up here pretty bad and all, and we ain't done singing. We're going to sing some more in just a minute. I want to read uh, in Luke chapter 10. Go with, over with me to verse 30. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. The Bible says, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he was, had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said to him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, which now of these, one minute. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy unto him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. That's the story of what we call the good Samaritans, what we typically call that for good reason. But I want to preach tonight on this thought, the dangers of the ditch. The dangers of the ditch. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. God, I pray that you'd help us that we be people, Lord, to stay in the middle of the road. God, on the, on the high spot in the road and keep our eyes on you. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach that we'd be challenged from the word of God tonight. God, I thank you for the singing tonight, the piano playing, those that do the sound. Lord, I thank you for the uh, Brother Bryant leading the singing. Lord, I just thank you for everything that's been done here. I thank you for good service. A lot of visitors this morning. God, we thank you for that. God, I just pray that you'd help us tonight. We'd be challenged in our hearts. Lord, if there'd be one here tonight's lost, I pray that you'd work in their heart. Lord, they'd turn to you and get saved. God, I pray for revival over at Trinity. I pray that even probably about right now as the evangelist gets in the pulpit, Lord, that you'd use them to uh, help the people. Lord, through the week, Lord, I thank you that our ladies got to go to a good retreat this Friday and Saturday. I thank you for that and the testimonies they shared this morning. We got here tonight. I pray that you'd help us, help me to preach truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to uh, look at this, this passage, and we know it's, it comes on the heels of the, uh, go back up and let's just look at verses 25 and read through there. It says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer to that is nothing. You're not going to do anything to get it. But, he, but the Lord just kind of put a trick there, test, testing his heart there. And he said, uh, he, said, he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, uh, And who is my neighbor? And the Lord gave him that story and the one that fell among the thieves and the three that passed by, and there's a whole other message there, uh, but it's not, the, not what I want to preach tonight. But he, he said, if you notice there, uh, in verse 31, 
He says, uh, and by chance there came down a certain priest on the way, by, I mean that way, and there, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed by on the other side. And they went around, crossed the road, went over the other side to go around him and by going on the other side, and it was a road, and I know they didn't have motor graders and all the things we have with our roads now and the angling of it and the curvature of the road and all, probably some did, probably some didn't, maybe just by the wagon wheels and donkey feet and people feet, they might have worn that way, but, but I'm assuming because he went to the other side that it probably was a ditch on both sides of the road as most roads are. And there I'm getting my title, just using this passage as a springboard, and I want to preach that night on the dangers of the ditch. Now, the, uh, there's ditches in life, many ditches in, in this life we'd come across. There's, there's a ditch of destruction for lost folks. They're just in a ditch. They've never been saved. God's never took them out of the ditch, put them up on the high side of the road and the high spot in the road and the glory land way, if I can call it that. And they're just in the ditch. Their life is in a ditch. Now they might have riches. They might have big homes, nice cars, big jobs and titles. And uh, they might have all that. But without Jesus, all that is vanity. All that is absolutely nothing. Amen. And then there's the ditch of sin, whether it be a lost person or a saved person. When saved people, we get, we'll get. we look at in a little bit more in little depth of that in a few minutes. But, but there's ditches and there's the, temp, the temptation of the ditch. It pulls us and people get in the ditch on the sides, get sidetracked and find themselves in sin. Lost folks in their ditch of destruction, eternal destruction, they're also just living in a life of sin. There's the ditch of unfaithfulness for Christians. We talked about that starting Sunday school this morning and then in the preaching hour I talked about unfaithfulness a little bit this morning. Uh, me and Brother Bryant's already been up here talking about unfaithfulness uh, tonight a little bit and all, and how unfaithfulness plagues uh, Christianity. Unfaithfulness plagues families and the Christian families and unfaithfulness, and it's a ditch. It starts off, a lot of times people are going down the middle of the road and, boy, this or that pulls them to the side. Next thing you know, they just fell off in a ditch and faithfulness can nowhere be found. I, I don't know what's going on in the age we live in. People don't want to work, don't want to do anything. People ain't faithful. People want to be faithful to church. Now, thank God that I'm preaching to the choir tonight, preaching to those uh, that are faithful for the most part. But, boy, we have an area of service. We ought to be in our place. We ought to be there, be ready and serve. Hey, there's faithfulness. There's a ditch of despondency in the Bible. And, boy, it's a ditch when we get despondent, when we get discouraged, and we just keep on sliding deeper into that ditch. And I think about that. I, I think about, uh, uh, well, in the Bible, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, he fell off in a place in a ditch of despondency. And, and you know, Lord met him there. He come, brought a raven, brought him a peanut butter jelly sandwich and a juice box, and he had all those things to eat. And, but anyway, and there's ditch of religion. Man, you'll pass all kind of buildings to get here. Some of them got a cross on top, some of them got a pulpit, and most of them got some form of a Bible. And then I know there's down there on off of 75 to the west of 75, down there by Perry, there's a a uh, big old religious building. Man, I, they got a bunch of fancy artwork and architecture in that, architecture in that building. It's a shame they don't have truth on the inside, isn't it? It's a ditch. People meaning well. Uh, I mean, one a little closer than that, right up the road that way. Folks meaning well. They get in there, man. They work hard. They're kind, nice people with good ethics and all that. But they deny the Jesus of the Bible that he is a son of God. He's just a physical earthborn son that was just a good man. But it's a ditch. And all that have slid off the road and fell in that ditch, they're just in that ditch. There is hope, though. There is hope. Ditch and pit in the Bible are often, not always, but often synonymous, meaning that it could be a ditch, it could be a pit as we know it, and I think of a pit usually as a round hole without, with just sides in a hole like a, a well without water. We'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, and ditch, 
but it can be a, a pit and a ditch can be the same thing. Uh, so they can be the same, but I'm, for the sake of the message, kind of think of it as the same thing. The dang, could call it dangers of the pit, but I'm going to call it dangers of the ditch. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Man, this afternoon I toyed around with this thought, and I looked, and I thought, no, nah, I ain't going to do that. But I start with us, our anniversary being Tuesday. I, 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 man, I went over in Ephesians, looked around a little while and all, and I, I started to preach how to stay married for 36 years. <laughs> and, boy, there's some guidelines in there, man, just keeping Christ first, loving one another, uh, helping one another, forgiving one another, and all that stuff. So you got the message anyway, just not the full length of it. But Matthew chapter, chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14, the Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And it's a narrow gate. Matter of fact, there's only way in that gate, and his name's Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, life. No man comes to me, comes to the Father, but by me. Um, Brother Charles, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you always willing to help out. If you'd make your way up here and pass this out, and uh, Sandra's going to play, with, I'm not going to put Miss Don on the spot like that. She may or may not know it. I no doubt she's got talent enough. She could probably just sight read it and play it if she didn't know it. But we kind of plan this. We don't want to throw her a curveball. But this song is kind of about staying out of the ditch, about just going down. Matter of fact, we sang, we sang some good songs tonight, didn't we, already? And a couple of those were kind of dealing with the subject of going on that way. How many of y'all know this song, The Glory Land Way? Amen. I, I don't think it's in our hymn book. It'd be bad if it was and we took time to print all these copies. And I looked in the special book and it's not in there either. But I want to just kind of sing it together and look at the words to it and think about that, the glory land way. Man, we're, we're moving yonder on the ship of Zion. We're uh, assuming you're saved. Uh, I believe by most of your testimonies, you're saved folk. And... Man, there's, there's ditches on both sides of us. It'd been really worked out good if everybody had to sit in the middle there and the sides be the ditch. But as it bees, I'm sorry, y'all just in the ditch over there. Everybody got a copy? All right, let's go ahead. Hmm. Maybe not quite as fast, but pretty good. Yeah, just listen to the words. Man, it's just about living for Jesus, going down the road. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way I'm in the glory land way Telling the world that Jesus saves today Yes, I'm in the glory land way I'm in the glory land way in the glory land way listen to the call the gospel call today get in the glory land way wanderers come home oh hasten to obey get in the glory land way I'm in the glory land way I'm in the glory land way heaven near and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way onward I go rejoicing in his love I'm in the glory land way soon I shall see him in that home above oh I'm in the glory land way I'm in the glory land way I'm in I'm in the glory land way. Amen.
Thank you. Good singing. Good singing, everybody. How many of you have never heard that song before? That's a good no, isn't it? But that message there, uh, we've received him. We've trusted. We're on our way. We need to tell others so they can get in the way. And then if, you, if you're not in that way, you need to hear the message and get in that way. And then the last of just keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay on the, hey, stay on the high spot in the road and just keep on for Jesus in the middle of the road. So I want to talk about that a little while. The, the, the bright and shining way, the glory land way, let's just use that for a kind of a, 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 a straight uh, fix there as we see there, that, that narrow way that we see there in Matthew chapter 7. And consider that, look at the ditch and thinking about that. Now, uh, you know, roads are curved. I don't know if you know that or not. Now, some roads are flat. Now, I'm not talking about curved like 42 but they've got a crest, and you'd be surprised a 16-foot or a 20-foot wide road may have four or five inches of rise in it, but you don't really see that. You think it's flat. And um, anyway, I just want to talk about some ditches in the Bible uh, tonight. Go back with me if you would. To Gen- We're not going to turn to all these, but I do want to turn to the one in Genesis 37. Well, I think about old Joseph. And the, his brothers was jealous of him. The daddy had made him that coat. And they was jealous. And he had that dream. And that dream of those good years and bad years and all that. They didn't like their lot falling on them. They didn't like the things that were brought up in that dream. You know, Joseph the dreamer. So they went and... Let me, let me see, let's start about verse, let's see, Genesis 37, start about verse 16. Now you know those in Alabama, don't you? See, in verse 16, it says, he said, I seek my brother and tell me, I pray thee where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. <laughs> and Joseph went after his brother and found them in Dothan. That's not Alabama, I was teasing and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to the other, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Look at him coming. All better than us. Got that fancy coat on daddy give him. Probably looking at us, thinking, Oh, there's those that's going to get the bad years and all that in that dream. He says, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast had devoured him, and we shall see what he will overcome, that what will overcome of his dreams. And boy, Reuben had a plan there. I, I like, I'm glad Joseph, well, he didn't hear him speak up, but uh, maybe later on heard about it there because he was still a far coming up to him. But Reuben had a plan. He said, let's not just kill him quite so quick. He said, he heard it and he delivered him out into their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of his hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. That's a pit. I'm preaching about ditches. We're going to Call it, consider it a pit, a ditch, the same thing. It's a spot that he couldn't get out of his own, nothing less. He said the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with the camels bearing spicery and balm. They just come, let's think about it there. There's a picture there, and there's a whole other message there in the depths of it, the inexhaustible word of God, but they're coming out of Gilead, and they've got balm on there. So there's, you can see a little picture of Jesus in there coming by that saved him from death in the pit there, and that balm of Gilead came by just in time. But it says, balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is if we slay our brother and conceal his blood. So Reuben won't throw him in the ditch. Reuben, uh, Judah had a better idea. Hey, let's sell him and make some profit out of it. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let, us, let our hand 
uh, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then they were passed by the Midianites, merchandisemen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Where so Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces. Uh, but I think about this, that's a, a cheap price, really, isn't it, for what Joseph, now, what they meant for evil, the Lord meant for good, and he sold it. I mixed something up there. Okay, I was wondering sometimes I get some figures mixed up and some things, and I transpose some numbers sometime, but. Oh, inflation, okay, yeah, okay. Well, I was just thinking uh, it may have been a lot of money. I don't know, you probably can find some little side notes, something like that, but I'm thinking no matter how much it was as a cheap price for what he redeemed his brethren in years to come later on when that dream unfolded before their eyes. I think about Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver, but that was cheap compared that he was uh, sold and let it go. And, of course, his perfect will anyway that he had to go and go to that cross as he's turned over them before they crucified him and all that. And, man, what a price was paid for my sin if yours got us out of the ditch, wasn't it? But I just wanted to point that passage out there and read through there and see that it was a, a ditch there in the Word of God. It was a pit that, that he got thrown into that pit there. But, but God took that for good and he, he was stuck there and, and they thought that they would uh, use it for gain and profit and all that, not realizing how much later on down the road, boy, Joseph, you know, by that time when Joseph come back to them, the power he had and the authority in the king's house and all that he had, uh, Joseph could have slew every one of them and could have paid them back like what our minds might think about doing, but oh no, he didn't. And he sent back, man, it's just an amazing story. If you go on and read that, but he, he, was, in a, he was in a ditch, he got thrown in a ditch, got thrown in a pit. In Luke 14, 19, it talks about if your ox in a pit, in a ditch, if your ox in a ditch, get him out. And uh, I just want to say on that thought there, a lot of times, uh, man, surely there's times that you, uh, the ox gets in the ditch and it's time to go to the house of God and, and uh, man, the ox in the ditch and you can't. I, I know sometimes things happen and the car won't crank and, and yeah, by the time you get the battery charge out, plug it in or, you know, if you got two cars and jump cable, by the time you get all that, you'll be done missed half the service and all, and, and your hands are dirty and all. And I understand those things. God knows about those things. But I'm afraid a lot of times we put ourselves in that ditch. And, man, sometimes we steer the ox and toward it and kind of don't really want to be faithful tonight. And the flesh is pulling and drawing. And, and man, we got every kind of ditch. And, uh, boy, it seems like a lot of folks got ditches anymore. A lot of times ditches just to keep them up, being from faithful, being at the house of God. Joseph got thrown in a ditch. A lot of times we'll put our own ox in the ditch. We ought not do that. Men, hear me. Listen out on this next one, Proverbs 23, 27. The Bible says, a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. I didn't turn to it to read it. I've got it written over here, and I can't remember if it says deep ditch or if it just says a whore is a ditch, but it says a strange woman is a narrow pit. Well, I've known a lot of men that was in God's service. I was, uh, um, I'm talking about preachers from all over the place that I've known through the years, not only preachers, laymen, and, you know, just Christian men that were faithful for the most part. They was in the glory land way. They was going on the road. And, and what hurts is the one I think about, I think the ones that I think about through the years. And man, I, I can sit there and write you out a list of men that I've sat under and enjoyed their preaching back through the years. And man, they was going down, they was in the, at the top of the curve of the road, running along pretty well. And boy, they saw something in the ditch. They got the eyes on it. That messed your mind up and everything. And before you know it, they didn't pull right off in the ditch and got out of the ditch. And, man, they just uh, messed up and ruined their life and ruined their uh, ministries. Just, just messed up. They got in a ditch. Boy, I think about the, another place in Matthew 15, uh, verse 14, I believe it is. It says, this blind leading the blind and both fall in a ditch. I, I believe the story there is the Pharisees and the lost and a religious crowd trying to tell folks what to do and Jesus basically well you're just the blind leading the blind and you're just going to go in a ditch boy uh, 
I could apply that a lot of ways if you ever hear me preach something that don't sound right and start going left field and deviate from the word of God. Man, y'all get y'all selves together. And I ain't talking about if you don't agree with because you don't like truth. But I'm talking about if I deviate from truth, truth or any other man, if you're ever somewhere else or any man after me, but I plan on being here a long time. So, but if you go to uh, somebody gets deviating from truth and tries to work, add a little, little something else to salvation besides salvation by faith through because of grace in Jesus Christ, what he did, start changing up on that or, uh, man, messing with the doctrines of the word of God, uh, boy, don't, don't put up with it. Don't have it. Don't hear it. I, I, I mean, it'll never cease to amaze me when men take a church off in the left field somewhere, what are the people doing to sit there and follow a man blindly? And somebody gets their eyes off Jesus, they're blind. And then when the, when the crowd of folks follows after them, it's just the blind leading the blind. They end up in a ditch. Churches that have once stood for truth, just, just I don't want to understand, I don't get it. Follow a man off. Now, I know people are deceptive, and I understand that. And, and uh, somebody come in and change a little thinking or something and head, and, and most people a lot of times will just follow right along with it and all that. Oh, stick with the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved. Hey, study to make sure I'm approved. If I, man, if I say something questionable, you don't believe, believe it or agree with it, ask me about it. And um, study to see what yourself. I hope you never catch me in that. I hope if you don't agree with it, it's because you didn't understand what I said. Or, hey, and I might be wrong. I might interpret a little passage a little bit different that you've heard it before sometime. But it won't be one, some, one of the main doctrines of the Bible. I promise you that. If it is, y'all will get together and run me out of him. Blind leading the blind, both fall into a ditch. Well, there's a good ditch. There's Elijah's ditches. We talked about First Kings 19 a while ago. It might be Second Kings, but we talked about that a while ago was despondency. But before that, man, he dug some ditches. Remember the prophets of Baal? And uh, I, that, that passage really is kind of humorous to me. I mean, it's glorious, it's grand. It's, can I use that word again? It's marvelous. But it's a little bit of humor in here, I believe, how they dug the ditches. He dug, told them to dig those trenches around that altar. And uh, he told the prophets of Baal, at first told them to, to and he said, well, is he asleep? Does, he, does your God sleep and all that? And it's kind of like, where is he at? He must be asleep. He can't, he can't hear you today. You know, and then, then when it come time to prove who God was, who Jehovah God was, the almighty true one God, and uh, he said, well, this ain't enough. Y'all ain't got enough out there. So he dig trenches. He said, fill them up with water. Put, get your buckets full. Fill them up with water. Was it three times they fill them up or seven times? Three times, I think. Anyway, they put a bunch of water in there and then the fires of God, from the fires of heaven reached down and licked up that water. Boy, those ditches there proved how powerful God was. And, you know, and, and man, you thought surely, oh, Elijah, seeing that power of God, can you imagine witnessing that? Think about that. But can you imagine... Oh, we all going to witness it one day. Great white throne judgment. I believe we'll witness that. And all the professors of false gods, boy, they're going to be cast to eternal ditch, aren't they? Sad, isn't it? But think about that. Seeing the power of God displayed in that magnitude. I mean, literally, fire from heaven come down and just drink up that water and dry up that water and set that wet, that soaked altar on fire, that wet altar. Think about that. Wouldn't you think that'd be enough to keep Elijah straight down the middle of the road? I mean, right slap in the middle of the road. But then just a short time after, in chapter 20, Jezebel's tongue, she threatened to go whoop him, get him killed. Like she, she was mad and Prophet Bell was killed. And she threatened to do the same to Elijah. And then he got scared, got his eyes off God, got to thinking about old Jezebel. I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know if any of y'all ever heard Joe Arthur preach, but he refers to it as that old hag when he says Jezebel, that old hag. There's a great truth in the life of Jezebel. But I ain't preaching about that at night. But her tongue put Elijah in a pit. And he got 
he, I'm sure the chapter 19, boy, when those fires reached down and grabbed it, grabbed up that water and lit off them altars. I'm sure, man, he was in the glory land way, kicking high. And then there come those words, evil words, and put him right in the ditch. And I think that's a note to all of us. We not, may not be hags, but just a little bit off the tongue can put somebody that's in the middle of the road, can put them in a ditch. We've got to be careful with that, hadn't we? Amen. But a lot of, there's a lot of ditches in the Bible. Back to our text in Luke chapter 10. I want to just make reference. We might look at this, but uh, there's a deliverance. Often there's a deliverance out of an eternal pit or ditch. In Psalm 40, verse 2, he brought me up out of a horrible pit, and put my, out of the mire clay and put my feet on a solid rock. Are you saved, Dave? You know Jesus. Boy, I'm glad that I'm eternal ditch proof. I'm glad he put a self-navigation system that's a lot better than what Tesla's got to offer. <laughs> that don't mean we can't slide off in a ditch, though. So there's a deliverance of the ditch. There's a drawing of the ditch. And now this traveler in here, in verse 30 there, he had help. He didn't choose the ditch. But the thieves came along and put him in the ditch, didn't they? They stripped his clothes and beat him and left him half dead on the side of the road. We're assuming it was a ditch for the sake of the message. You know, I was talking about a while ago and earlier that roads have a curvature of it. But let me tell you something. I've done front end alignment before and the geometry of steering, you don't line a car up where all four wheels are perfectly straight. If you did, it'd be all over the road. You'd have to, every second, you'd have to be fighting the steering wheel. The front end's towed in a little bit, I mean the front tires, let me turn around that way, they're pointing in just a smidge of that way, I mean just a few thousandths, less than a sixteenth of inch on most cars. And then it's also not straight up and down. If they were that way, it'd really be all over the road, but they got a positive caster to them. They're actually tilted far. The actually is where it makes the car drive straight. If you set one negative caster or a straight caster, zero caster, man, that thing will be all over the road. That customer's going to be back in a few minutes if he makes it back. And we say, man, something wrong with this car. But, but the Holy Spirit of God, let me say, he put our caster and our toe in exactly right to keep us in the middle of the road if we keep our eyes on him. But we'll get crossed up. Maybe we hit a rut in the road or something and bend one of them tie rods and mess up our steering system. And I'm talking about just run-ins with sin, run-ins with temptation, get our steering system messed up where we're not keeping our eyes on Jesus. And that road, the ditch will, I use the phrase, will suck you over in it. Uh, it was sometimes, it was scary. It was a little bit fun but it was more scary driving that school bus on, uh, go down Charles Smith to the end of it and Mule Creek Road. How many of y'all ever drove, made a ride at the end of that road and went all the way up? If you go all the way out, you know, it'll end up over yonder on uh, Taylor Mill, Marshall Mill. But just about as soon as you turn to the right off of Charles Smith, as far as you can see before you get into the woods, that road is so deceptive. After a good rain, you don't realize the curvature of it, but exactly, sister, she went like that. Man, that school bus, you'd be on the, you'd hug that right side going that way. I'd hug that right side, and before you know it, I look in the mirror, I see the back side of that bus that way, and ain't one thing doing, that's hammered down, it's steer to the right, and it's kind of fun, but it's kind of scary. Not that she's going to get hurt or hurt the children at all. I, I wouldn't even consider that to be fun. But you got to make that dreaded call, say, boss, going to get me. I'm stuck in the ditch. <laughs> but ditches are deceptive. And they're drawing. There's a drawing of the ditch. This, th this man had, he had help being put in the ditch. But be careful. we got to keep our eyes and make right judgments so we don't slip off into that ditch. There's the drawing of the ditch. There's the deception of the ditch. 
can be very deceptive. You've got to be careful. Everything looks flat and smooth, but it's probably not. And in life, well, the devil's so subtle, he'll slip in. He don't need you to just outwardly and jump heads, head first into some big manner of sin. He's probably not going to work that way to distract you toward the ditch. But he'll make it look real smooth and pretty and draw you just a little bit to the side, just enough that you get on. Man, I remember uh, years ago, man, I think about driving in ditches and this message, so many just living examples, but we had a little Bronco too. Man, I wish I had another little Bronco too. That was a fun little car to have and it was four wheel drive and all. And I remember we was uh, coming out Knoxville Road Headed home one night, lived close to where we live now, and right there about where Itchy County Creek's at, across Itchy County Creek and going around there, and I don't know about now, I really hadn't paid any attention, but there's a pretty good, where the road's been paved several times, there's like a drop off like this far on the side road, but it's grass so you don't see it. And I remember we was going through there, and I don't remember what happened. I know one night going the other way, an owl flew out in front of us, we swore, but I don't remember that night what happened, but one, one way, uh, for whatever reason, Man, we slid off side that road and the tires got in that thing. There wasn't no uh, easing back up on there. And I, oh, you know, I did what causes cars to flip. I oversteered, but that, that ditch was deceptive. And uh, man, that, that thing would hit us. And I didn't know a Bron they flipped. A lot of them flipped. They were known like Jeeps for turning over, but they will, 50 mile an hour, they will slide sideways down the middle of the road. I can promise you that. But it was very deceptive, that little ditch. It was there on the side the road. I didn't know it. I didn't see it. And I wish I could remember what it was that caused us to, I may have just been looking over at you and just got sidetracked and run off the road. I don't know. <laughs> Deception of the ditch. No problem. Oh, I got this. I can just take my hands off the wheel, just drive on. I can handle this. Be careful, the ditch is very deceptive. There's distractions in the ditch. Well, think about years ago, if you go up Clay Road in Jasper County, you can go to Google Earth and do that if you want to look that up, Clay Road, Monticello, Georgia. And about the middle of the road between Highway 83 and Highway 16, which is not far from Fresh Air Barbecue, on the other end of it, but Clay Road runs between those. My family and my lane roots and heritage is about in the middle with that, and there's Lane Road goes down toward the river. And uh, my grandmother's house, the house my daddy grew up in, it sits up on a hill right there, across the street from Lane Road where it goes down to the river. And when I was little, he's going to say, my grandmother, we'd go she, you know, for fun, and probably she's probably try. I know now she pro I probably didn't talk her ears off and ask her a gazillion questions. So she probably was just trying to walk some energy off where I'd go take a nap. But she let us go for a walk, and we'd go down Lane Road and go about probably about a third of a mile down that road. I don't know why I got a third because usually it's a quarter mile or a half mile, but I don't know, seven, eight hundred yards down that road, and there was a post we turned around. But guess what was in the ditch? Certain times of year. May pops, I love them. You know you can eat may pops; they're good, but they got to get shriveled up and ugly before they're good to eat. But we'd get the big, healthy ones, the big pretty ones. You know when they're big and take them home, and put toothpicks in them, and make pigs and cows out of them. But I said that to say there was may pops in the ditch, and there's deception in the ditch. There's distractions in the ditch. We'd be distracted and see that and get those may pops, but you had to be careful because there was also a bush that had a little orange berry called poison sumac. Any y'all ever had an encounter with that stuff? You itch for weeks. Well, not really, but hours. But you got to be careful when you see things on the side row that look good. They may be good, maybe nothing. No, I can't find one Bible verse wrong with a Maypop. But you reach for that and you got to be careful because you might get them some poison sumac. Just saying in life, got to be careful. There's distractions in the ditch, and there's things that will keep our eyes off of that and cause us to run. There's a deception, and there's a distraction of it. And you got to be careful, the devil's in the ditch. 
he lives in the low places. But he comes far to, to the high place. He'll meet you in the middle of the road and run right along with you. Think everything's great if you don't know who he is and what he looks like. And I'm talking figuratively, a deception of sin. As he's the great deceiver and the liar. Well, think about, uh, I, I tell you a story. A friend of mine when I was a little boy lived in Monticello. I'd, we'd go over to his house and play and all. And I'd went over to Mark. Um, Oh my, I can't, his dad was a and I can't think of his last name right now. I'll tell you his name in a minute when I think of it. Uh, but anyway, what, I went over there and we was playing. We played in the hills and all back behind his house in the woods. And, and you know, quicksand, by the way, all my life, I grew, I grew up scared to death of quicksand because I was sitting in westerns. But I ain't never seen none. And I don't think it's near as dangerous as they make it out to be. But we got out, and he told us, he told me there's quicksand out in the ditch in the front of their road, right by the, you know, in their front yard by the road. And we got out there, and we played in there and played in that quicksand and, and got, got it all over, and it was just Georgia red clay. And I remember we went in the house and snuck in through the basement and went to the bathroom down there and put our legs over in that uh, bathtub and washed that red clay off. And his mama come in there, and she took me home. But that's... <laughs> Mike Caldwell, that was his name. We thought we were playing in quicksand, but I tell you that kind of on the humorous side, but I do remember the devil's in the ditch. And I remember when Eastman, we could drive through town and get to the church that we, that I pastored my first pastorate, and I don't know, it was uh, through town, nice little ride through the country back out to the church, or you could go out out Soperton Highway a little ways and cut through about five, six miles of dirt road. And I remember one particular Sunday, I, I guess it probably was a Sunday evening in the summertime going to church. And uh, lo and behold, riding there along down the crest of the road and looked over and guess what I saw in the ditch? A rattlesnake sitting there. The devil. The devil himself. Not really. But close. And I remember pulling up and now my wife when we first started dating every time be riding around, she was intrigued by me because I'd see a snake in the road, I'd pull over and catch him. But not that one. But we saw that thing and pulled over and I remember pulling over toward the edge of the ditch, getting real close and letting the children see that's a rattlesnake, that's a genuine, real rattlesnake. And he I, I don't know what I did. I'm I i do not remember if I was able to get him to shake his tail, let him hear that real noise. I'm going to tell you, how many of y'all have heard a real rattlesnake? That's an eerie sound. But it's just like the devil. I know if I'd have got off in that ditch, been walking, what if I'd reached over there for a maypop? It would have hurt me. Now, I'm telling you this in stories, but I hope you get where I'm going, my purpose and all that. Be careful of the ditch. The Lord would have to stay on the on the Gloryland Road. He'd have to stay on the crest of the road up in the middle in the high spots, keeping eyes on him and eyes on the cross, eyes on Jesus, and just keeping on. Taste, see that the Lord is good, and just stay good. Stay your eyes on him. Just keep on tasting. Just stay straight. But boy, we get off on the side of that road. Now you got to be careful what's in the ditch because you rest sure the devil's in the ditch waiting for you to get there. He'll tell you things like, boy, it's comfortable over here, isn't it? This is nice, ain't it? You don't even have to have all that responsibility serving. You can kind of do what you want to do over here in this ditch. He'll tell you all kind of lies, but be careful. The devil lays in a ditch. And then I think of one more as, as thing, a life example. There's difficulty getting out of the ditch. Man, I've seen Christians that had been on the hike on the crest of the road and for one little reason or another, Started sliding off in the ditch, kind of like down on Mule Creek Road. You just, before you know it, you're over in that ditch. And they get there, and it just breaks your heart to see them. They talk like they want to do right, and they want to get back right. They want to get back in a place of repentance before the Lord and get back faithful to the house of God. But the ditch just holds them in there. And it's just difficult. I don't know what, I can't explain the holding power of the ditch. But I, got, I know this, it's got to do with the drawing of the flesh and the old man, the flesh loving sin and not liking serving God. And it's so easy to get in that ditch and just run along. But I think about Daddy had an old Willis Jeep. 
I don't even think it had no glass in the windows. It had a windshield, but it had no glass in the windows. I don't believe the side windows. So I'd put a 283 Chevrolet in it. We'd go, when I'd stay with him, and he lived out on a dirt road in Monticello. And I remember one night, we had been raining for a few days, and we went out in that old Jeep. We rode all around on some dirt roads in that old Jeep. And I remember we got back about maybe a half mile or so from his house, and Dad was going to show me how that four-wheel drive worked and how that old Jeep was tough and wouldn't get stuck. And we pulled off in that ditch. And I remember we rolled along and rode. He was like, uh-oh. He called me Little Jim. And I really don't remember saying this, but I can just imagine. He probably said, Little Jim, hold on. <laughs> like, uh-oh. And we was riding along, and he had the steering wheel turned to the left. We was riding along that ditch, just kept us down there. The whole thing was just a chugging along, going through there. And, and, I, and I, I probably wasn't running four or five miles an hour, but it wouldn't come out of the ditch. It just kept running in the ditch. It was difficult getting out of the ditch. But it finally, I don't know if it was a rock or what, but boy, we hit a, a bump in that ditch. And as, as slow as we were going, now this is four headliners. This one you park going over your head, they wasn't nothing but some steel over your head. And we hit something, man, I probably wasn't about 14 or 13. Man, I come out of that seat and pop my head on the roof of that Jeep, put a knot on my head. And we got out of the ditch, but I still had a knot on my head. And we get off in the ditch sometimes as Christians. You may get out of the ditch. I promise you it ain't worth it. Because you get knots on your head. And you get things that'll hurt you for a long time. And you get scarred up. Sure, there's grace. Praise God for grace. Amen. And God will forgive you. But you still got knots on your head. You still have those battle wounds. Go with me to the book of James. James chapter 4. Well, let me find a good place to start reading. Let's start at verse 4. Because there's a good place to consider being on the middle of the road and getting drawn to a ditch. It says you, really the whole book of James County is, but Verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is the en enemy of God. We'll get to toying with the world, the deception of the world, the ways of the world. we we'll start pulling off in a ditch. It says, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I believe we could apply that resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I believe we could use that to keep on, keep our eyes straight. Don't go toward the ditch. Don't reach down and be careful if you reach for a maypop. Don't keep your hand down there too long. But just be careful. But just keep going forward, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But then if you do, when you slide off in that ditch, verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. But I want to focus on that, draw nigh to God. Just stay nigh to him, you ain't got to worry about the ditch. Be careful in life. Be careful of the devil and his... the. Fiery darts of the devil, the wiles of the devil. Be careful because they'll pull you right in the ditch. But if you, you say, well, I, we're here Sunday night. We're faithful. We would never get in the ditch. I've seen some faithful, faithful Christians that were really examples to follow after. Slide in a ditch and die in a ditch. But if you ever get there, just draw nigh to God. I promise you, he'll pull you out of that ditch. He'll put you right down the middle of that road. You might have bumps on your head, but he'll put you right back on that road and keep you on that glory land way road. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Maybe here tonight and you're in a ditch. It's none of my business. Bring that to the altar tonight. Come nigh to him. 
I like that, come nigh to him, he'll, he'll draw nigh to you. That's kind of meet, you, meet him halfway. You know what? The grace goes a lot further than halfway, though. Just reach your hand out. He'll get it. You might be in a ditch. You might be headed toward a ditch. You might have been tempted toward a ditch. What do you need to do tonight? Let's just take a minute. And I know playing or anything. If you need to come to the altar tonight, just come on down. Don't leave here lost. If you're here today and never been saved, come on down here. Let's talk about it. Let me show you from the scriptures how you can know that you know that you know that you've got a home in heaven. Let's just take a minute. And, uh, in just a minute, uh, one's come. If anybody else comes, but after the altar's cleared, Brother Brian, if you'll dismiss us in a word of prayer, I'd appreciate it. Amen. Before you dismiss, let me say something. When you was praying, brother, I was, this is how the Lord works. I was saying something that I left something off that I didn't have my notes, but I thought about the passage, and I was going to challenge it with be the Samaritan, be the one somebody's in ditch, but there's a tie to that in Scripture. The Bible says, ye who are spiritual. In other words, keep your life straight. Don't get in the ditch to help them. Be careful and uh, be wise. And, 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 by, and as soon as I was thinking that, you said... That growing up in the country, now you don't get in a ditch to pull them out of the ditch. So, so I'm glad you said that because I was sitting there thinking that about be the Samaritan. I should have closed with that as well, to be the Samaritan willing to help them out of the ditch. But be careful because the ditch can pull both of you in there. And I also I love when the Lord does things like that and just puts, puts thoughts together and all. And all God's children said, amen, amen. shake hands with one another. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. What was that Thursday? Wednesday? Thursday? Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Okay. Amen. Okay. And back, back already in the house, God. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all have a good week. Be careful getting them Maypops. They're a little early right now. Don't get, leave them alone. Let them ripen. <laughs>